I'd like to talk about lineages and teachers. And Rod, could you help us give us an idea of sort of your lineage and uh, the teachers that, and, and what your feelings were toward the teachers in that lineage? Uh, my spiritual roots go back, uh, my traditions roots go back to Adi Shankara, um, one of the great sages so of, of, in the history of India, if not the globe. And I know Deepak and I have this in common, actually. Um, within his teachings, there are traditions and sub-traditions. Yeah. Um, so we can actually, we represent some of his sub-traditions. And, um, you know, to speak to my feeling of it, that's a very overwhelming thing to try and describe. Uh, um, in the same way you would have difficult time describing the love you have for your children, it would be hard to convey it completely. I feel the same toward my teachers and the teachers of my teachers. Uh, there are many blessings in my life, um, not, not the least of which is my family, but everything is brought to life through the gift of my teachers. Um, and so there really are no words to describe uh, my gratitude and uh, the fullness that, they bring, that it brings to my life. Wonderful. And uh, Rinpoche, how do you feel about your teacher and, and maybe describe a little of the Shambhala lineage? I think just being here, I was just feeling just great appreciation uh, for this event and just being here with our uh, friends and distinguished uh, panelists and all of you. Uh, I feel that lineage is something that's not particularly um, in the past, mm -hmm. even though it's continuity, but I feel very, it's very present in everything that um, I experience, especially when you're doing meditation and yoga. There's a sense of it really being very much alive. Um, I think that's part of the power of myself. It's a living lineage. It's not, some, it's not just sort of ancestor um, related, but there's a sense of uh, strength, I would say, that you're doing something that has been um, continued in, in, in the course of people's lives. And one of the most important things or strengths I draw from it is that almost every lineage figure that I'm have the privilege of you know, hearing about their um, life is uh, almost all of them had a really difficult time and that they really overcame a lot and there's a sense of their perseverance. And it was their perseverance and their sense of um, sort of dedication that allowed the lineage to continue or that tradition to continue. So it's it's, it's almost you feel a sense of gratefulness because otherwise if they didn't do what they did, yeah. you wouldn't be doing this. And so there's a real sense of appreciation. Um, so, you know, so I think it's interesting because a lot of times in our modern culture, everything's about you, but also there's a sense of really that, you know, there's, there can also be appreciation for how we got here. Yeah. And Deepak? I think everything's been said, but since you asked me the question, uh, my lineage, uh, like Rod Strikers, is uh, Adi Shankara. For those of you who don't know who he was, he was a child prodigy. He uh, started seeking um, enlightenment at the age of four. And uh, before he passed on or took what they call Mahasamadhi, the big meditation, he established four centers, one in the north, one in the south, one in the east, and one in the west of India, this is 800 AD. So my teacher was uh, Maharishi Maheshogi. My direct transmission was from Maharishi Maheshogi, who was um, directly part of that lineage. Afterwards, I also engaged with the Shankaracharya of Jyotirmat, the monastery in the north. And then um, during um, the last 20 years, I've been deeply influenced by other teachers who are offshoots of the same lineage. So one of them is uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj. And if anyone wants to get direct transmission through a book, please read it. I am that, Nisargadatta Maharaj. And the other one was um, Ramana Maharishi in, in the south of India. And the third one was Atmananda Krishna Menon. You know, almost everybody in the room, Deepak, um, meditates. Everyone here meditates almost. 
But we want to know why you meditate. I try to live in meditation. <laughs> so I think uh, meditation is uh, it'd be a good ritual. Um, and it helps for so many reasons. We've done a lot of research at our center, partly uh, funded by you and Gina and many others on the board. But uh, uh, we were able to show that in a five and a half day retreat, uh, of uh, meditation that we do twice a year. Um, the telomerase level, the enzyme that regulates the length of your chromosomes, went up by 40%, uh, which means that um, um, there was an effect on the genetic clock, which uh, is responsible for aging. But furthermore, we were also able to see that all the genes that cause homeostasis or self-regulation or healing for lack of a better word, went up some 17-fold. And other genes that cause inflammation went down significantly. There's no drug that can do that. And this study was uh, funded by supporters of the Chopra Foundation, including the Murdochs and many others. And I see some of them in the audience. Um, and um, it was in collaboration with Harvard, UCSD, uh, Duke University, UCSF. One of the uh, investigators along with us was a Nobel laureate, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. Uh, the paper was published in Nature, which is the highest impact journal you can imagine. And it actually um, brought along with other studies like this, meditation to the mainstream because direct effect on biology, the human brain, genetics, but that's not why we meditate. We meditate to get in touch with reality. And Rinpoche, why, why do you meditate? I think for myself, uh, meditation is very much um, sort of a very uh, human activity. Um, and I think that one of the most um, sort of essential elements of um, meditation is that one's uh, innate strength and goodness and uh, is already sort of within oneself. So I see meditation as a process of sort of allowing for that strength um, of who we are. And I think it's, you know, we're, in, we're in an interesting time because there's a lot of um, devaluing of the humanness. And uh, I think there's a you know, a real question about are we good, you know, are we as people? And I think meditation has always come from the point of view that our own enlightenment, our own wakefulness, our own strength is within our own mind and heart. And meditation, I think, is, is just that process of um, personally experiencing that. And uh, from that point of view, even if it's a very brief meditation, it's connecting with that. So it's connecting with something that's inherent that's not really describable, but you have to experience it. So, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a practice, but it's not a practice in repetition, but it's more a practice in, like, genuineness or authenticity. So you actually feel, um, you know, in a non-conceptual way, who you are. You're accessing your true self. Your true non-self. Non -self. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> I think Deepak, it was you that said uh, a lot of suffering is caused by confusing the selfie with the self. <laughs> You're not yourself. But this, this thing, this thing that you call the body mind, is your selfie. Yeah. Why, why do you why do you meditate? Uh, I think the simple answer as to why I meditate is is. Um, uh, it, uh, it, has, it has had such a profound effect on me, and if I, I were to be completely honest, I would say that it, the interest and in the seeking it out was the result of pain, you know, suffering. Um, my, my good fortune was that I became aware of my suffering at a fairly young age. And so at 18, I was already trying to find something, uh, I was in pursuit of something or sensing there was something that the world would not provide. 
no matter how successful or no matter how much I would accumulate or what I would accumulate. But there was something that the world wouldn't provide. And I intuitively, I think, knew that. Uh, so what began perhaps as a way to find the way out of pain or suffering was ultimately became uh, a way of discovering and reclaiming the greatest treasure. There's this uh, teaching in the Shiva Sutras. The concept is Maharada, and it means the great pool. And it's, there's this description of uh, in between lifetimes, we catch a glimpse of the glory of the self, which is said to be this golden pool. And it's so awe-inspiring that we recoil because it, it's, it's somehow our small identity can't quite fathom that this is us. And we get this glimpse. And then the drop, that leaves an impression where for, the, for when we become embodied, when we have body, is we seek out that remembrance, that re-experience of that. And my tradition says that that's the deepest samskara, is the samskara of the, see, of the hunger to see oneself again. And, and, and meditation becomes the vehicle. Yeah. I, when I think of yogis and Buddhists, I see so much, it, 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 that it, so many things that are similar, so many things that share purpose, share definition. And one of them is, I think the foundation of yoga in part is to attenuate the influence of the, of the kleshas. Can you talk about that, Rod, a little bit? Is this is something that you do with, with meditation specifically? Wow, kleshas, that's a small topic. Um, <laughs> so for those, uh, so we have a similar vocabulary, those are the causes of, the causes of affliction, causes of pain and suffering. Deepak actually shared about them last night. And in short, they're born, they're born from this one piece that I, um, actually dovetails with what I was saying about the Maharada, which is we still are identified with a small, with a, we don't identify ourselves as this great pool, this luminous pool of, of self. And as a result, we begin to create some fictions uh, as a result of that. And there are five kleshas, and I don't think it's the, necessarily the right time to do it. But at the, at the far end of that spectrum of what causes us suffering is uh, the, knowledge, uh, the knowledge and the fear of dying. And it uh, doesn't matter what we accomplish in the world, in essence, that fear follows us our whole life. Uh, and... Uh, Patanjali, the great sage of the yoga tradition, says uh, uh, pleasure is suffering and suffering is suffering. In other words, that even when we gain wonderful things, there's a fundamental fear that we're going to lose those wonderful things. Uh, so the point being that you know, meditation at its height is a kind of dissolving or is, a, is a, like a small death, a conscious death. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a res resolution around all of the things that we are so invested in in our life. Our friends, our family, our possessions, our goals, our career, our mm -hmm. dharma, our duties in the world. And so when we are in the depth of meditation, we come into, we interface, or we become uh, that which is beyond dying. Yeah. And so if we understand that key point that we get to see that part of ourselves that's beyond death on a consistent basis, what it starts to do is it, use the word, I think, attenuate. It begins to reduce that fundamental fear of loss because we become, oh, become aware of that thing which cannot be destroyed, which cannot be lost. Mm. Um, so, but the teachings are this, and I'll just add one other thing. Patanjali says that it can be attenuated, the glaciers can be attenuated through meditation if they're subtle. In other words, meditation alone is not enough if our, what's causing us suffering is significant. If it's really strong, we need other things in addition to meditation. Yeah. My understanding, though, Rinpoche, is that the Buddha, the Buddha, when he was in Deer Park, was also trying to unravel sort of the mysteries around the Kleshas. Sort of what, what, is the, what is your view of that? I think within uh, Buddhist tradition, you know, kleshas are something initially to sort of um, recognize and you know, overcome, and especially in terms of ignorance, passion, and aggression, mm -hmm. and that those kleshas are um, basically, you know, holding on to something in terms of um, level of attachment, 
aggression in terms of trying to destroy things, and ignorance in terms of not recognizing sort of things. And they're seen as sort of um, sort of states of the mind and expressions of the mind that, are, that become very um, experiential and in fact can create a whole uh, cycle of life. So kleshas are also connected with you know, the seeds of creating life cycles or realms. So that's um, so they're not just considered to be sort of minor sort of, um, you know, experiential blockages, but actually create a whole universe. Yeah. And you know, from that point of view, you have to then um, understand the essence of that. And you know, then then you would say the more sort of um, advanced or sort of deeper perspective is that you have to understand the nature of the klesha. And, you know, within the Buddhist tradition, that's where you get into mandalas and understanding the actual um, wisdom within the confusion. Yeah. So that, you know, that becomes a path, you know, which is sort of a deeper path. But I think a lot of it is, you know, it's your relation, where you are on the journey of understanding. So if you're very upset, then obviously you just need to calm down. Mm -hmm. But if you want to understand the nature of that anger, so it doesn't happen again where you can actually understand why is it that you're angry, that becomes a much deeper understanding. Deepak, do you see a meditation not only as well-being and having a better life, but part of that whole thing originally originated with dealing with suffering as a tool to deal with suffering and to uncover the, the source of suffering? Just to elaborate on what's already been said, um, how many people, just I'm curious, know anything about the life of the Buddha? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that he was a young prince and um, he happened to be in a very Aspen-like environment. <laughs> uh, uh, and it That's was actually Aspen Plus. Because, uh, he was not exposed to old age or suffering at all. He was surrounded by pleasure. And then one day when he went outside his enclosed environment into what is called the real world, he saw um, uh, an old person. And he asked his friend, uh, who was a stable boy, he said, what's that? And he said, well, that's an old person. So does everybody get old? And uh, he said, yes. Will I get old? Yes. And then they saw a person who was very disabled in extreme decrepitude, probably a leper. He said, what's that? He said, that's a, a person with uh, severe decrepitude and disability. He says, does that happen to everyone? He said, well, if you live long enough, it does. <laughs> And, and the third person they saw was the corpse, actually. It was the corpse being taken to cremation. I said, what's that? That's a dead man. Does everyone die? And the answer was, yes. Will I die? Yes, you will. So that started his search. And yeah, for those of you who don't know, actually, I wrote a biography on the Buddha's life, which I'll be happy to send to you, Rinpoche. And, and yourself, yeah. but he was a great yogi also. He practiced all the yogas, the pranayams, he practiced fasting. It was only when he gave up under, he gave up trying under the uh, Bodhi tree that he found what is called enlightenment. So uh, there's a great message in his, um, his um, teaching in that you don't, uh, um, go beyond the mind by using the mind. You know, the mind cannot get you to reality. You have to ultimately transcend that mind and transcend those sanskaras and vasanas and karma actually even, which is part of the uh, conditioned mind. Could you, could you define karma? <laughs> There's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, particularly in the West in these days about karma. Karma is just your conditioned mind. So, you know, every experience that you've had in the past, there's an interpretation of that experience, and uh, that's called a sanskara. 
and that creates the seeds of desire or what are called vasanas. So sanskara, vasana and karma are all the same thing. Uh, we keep repeating the same thing over and over again as a result of centuries of conditioning. So everyone's here right now in this room, in this moment, as a result of karma. Because otherwise you wouldn't be here. There would the other people who are in a bar or doing something else. So you are here. Karma creates the conditions of the present moment. But it does not bind you because you still, depending on your degree of awareness, you have the choice to do what uh, you want to do with the present moment. And the ultimate goal of life is to transcend it altogether. Yeah. In my research into your lineage, Rod, one of your teachers wrote a book where, he, where his teacher was quoted saying, you need to be conscious and consciously create your karmas or your karmas will create you. What does that mean? Well, it's exactly as Deepak described it. It's, it's that our past impressions create desires and we are likely to, f a, a nice short way of saying it, maybe, maybe it'll qualify as a Deepakism or a strikerism, yeah. but if you don't, you know, if, if you don't choose a different present, the past will choose it for you. Okay. And, and that's really at the heart of it. And that is that we have to be very conscious of shaping the present because there is an influence of the past. Uh, you know, those are just a few words, be here now, but that's not so simple because of the concept of karma, vasana, and samskara. It, it, it would be nice if it was so simple, but Deepak makes the really the critical point, which is that ultimately it is a choice because we've chosen those things in the past when we can extricate them, ourselves from them by choosing differently in the present. Well, maybe it's simple, it's just not easy. That's right. <laughs> it's simple, not easy. Yeah, so Rinpoche, how does that sync with the, the Buddhist tradition and the ideas of karma? Very well. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense, the path of Patanjali is very similar to the path of the Buddha. Well, I guess that's for everyone else to decide, but I think, um, I think one thing that I was just struck by was uh, the notion of karma, which often, as Deepak is saying, there's sort of sometimes sort of interpretations of what it is. And I think one of the things that is sort of linking karma and meditation is that meditation is really the, the place in the present moment where you're changing your karma or developing your karma or freeing yourself from karma. And so the power of your meditation it's not just recovery time from your life, mm -hmm. but it is a point where you begin to determine the trajectory of your life, how you would like to live, what are the principles you would like to live by. And you need that moment of, of quiet and also a little bit of um, you know, perspective to determine, do I want to, as we you know at the conference, like, do you want to lead with love? Do you want, do you want to lead with compassion? Do you want to lead with strength? Mm -hmm. And so the present moment is really like, um, uh, you know, it's a moment where the future is not really existing at this point, and it's, com but it's coming into existence very quickly. So meditation can be very powerful by determining, you know, what you do that day, really the direction of your life. And so that's, it's, you know, I always, one of the things that when I teach meditation, try to encourage people is that it looks like you're doing nothing, but there's so much happening. <laughs> so don't be fooled by inactivity. It looks like, oh, they're just sort of chilling out. And inside, it's powerful, as you know, Mr. Chopra said. All the research is showing that there's so much happening, mm. and so we're, we're the ancient wisdom is catching up with the technology, realizing, oh, this is a powerful human being deciding something, and we as people have decided how the world is right now, and we will decide how it's going to be. Did you want to add something, Deepa? Well, just a, a kind of a metaphor analogy that my teacher Maharishi used to use. So imagine a piece of cloth which is dyed, let's say the color red. And uh, every time you transcend in meditation, any, at any time you get beyond the mind, then you are washing that piece of dyed cloth. So the next time uh, it's a little faded, the color is not that strong. And you keep doing it, then finally all the color fades away. So the color is the karma that's slowly being washed away. 
That's great. So we talked about meditation. We're going to do a meditation in, in a few minutes. And I want to know from you, Rinpoche, how important is intention uh, when, you, when you begin to meditate? It's funny you ask that. <laughs> um, I mean, as you know, I mean, intention is, is something I feel like before you meditate, even if it's um, just a very simple inten in intention or, or motivation, because I almost think like motivation is like, you know, you know, meditation is like going for a walk. Why are you going on the walk? Why are you going on the journey? There's a journey taking place. And intention is just orienting yourself. And I think that's where your meditation be becomes enriched. Um, a lot of times if you have no idea where you're meditating, that's where you begin to lose perspective. People, you can get bored, and you get very distracted. Whereas I think if you have intention, then it's very much like a, you know, sort of a, the energy of the wind kind of in a positive way um, directing you. So motivation is, you know, um, in the Tibetan tradition, we call it tawa. Tawa means view, like you're looking at the top of a big mountain and you see where you're going. And the mind is, the mind is infinite in terms of what it, what it can do. And so the journey of meditation is just actually becoming familiar with your intention, staying with your intention, not constantly changing your intention, um, but rather uh, staying with it. Rod, what's, the, what's your tradition say about intention? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, but if, you know, I think I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently, and I, I'm actually going to speak to something that touches on intention, but is, is, is a little is a little bit different context. The idea that Rinpoche has uh, um, just shared, which is the idea that there's context to this practice, there's a, there's a reason for doing this practice, is really critical. But I even want to go back just one step further, because from our tradition, it's a fundamental perception. It, it's stepping into a fundamental perception that is holistic. A view, or have a specific view of the universe that you live in and your relationship to the universe prior to starting your practice. In other words, rather than trying to find oneness from your practice, establish oneness as an intention and at the very beginning. And understand that, in a sense, uh, the, the very... Um, the worldview that I bring to meditation will unfold the specific worldview that I bring to my meditation practice will unfold in my meditation practice. So in other words, if I start with this sense of meditation as first aid, like my meditation is a way of ameliorating my difficulties, that's probably all I'm going to get out of. And it's not really, an, it's, not, it's missing the larger point of our relationship to ourselves, to our to creator or creation, and if we can start with just taking a minute or two to reflect on the higher, more noble uh, perceptions that come from tradition, by the way, because this point of view I'm, I'm generally describing is not common language. It's not, you won't find it on Instagram. It's, it's, it's deeply embedded in our spiritual DNA. But, and that's the vision that these great sages and the, the, the lineage holders shared. And so what I would say is if one could draw from the greatest and noble truths and let that be the first step in moving into stillness or moving towards stillness, that would change our practice. So is meditation also a search for truth? Deepak, you think so? Yeah, it's only about that actually, search for truth. But I had just one or two things to what Rod said. Um, you know, intention has many levels. So. If Sanskrit is a language that um, has these nuances that um, can't be expressed in English. There are levels of intention in Sanskrit called para, pashanti, madhyama, vekari. So at a very subtle level, you may not be aware of your intentions because they are those sanskaras as a result of karma. And meditation allows you to have clarity of that. What is the essence of the subtlest intel uh, uh, intention. At a superficial level, your intention could be, I want a new car, or I want a private plane, or I want to marry this girl, or whatever. But uh, as you go deeper, 
then the intentions obviously change. They become, I think ultimately the subtlest intention is, who am I? Beyond all this, who am I? Um, and if you can just even not think about it, because you know the highest level is choiceless awareness, where you are not consciously making any choice or intention. In that, you allow the what, for lack of a better word, the the greater intention of the universe to express itself through you uh, in that choiceless being. Interesting. You know, my my. My own point of view, I've always said that the quality of my life would be determined in part by the questions I ask myself. Ramesha, when you, when you think about your practice and, you, and talking to your students, what questions do you encourage them to consider? Like when, Who am I? Um, I think that's an important question now, and I would almost say, who are we as humanity at this point? Um, I'm, I'm very just struck by the relationship between personal meditation and practice, and also how it's connecting with what's happening in society. And I, am also, I also ask the question of when you, as meditation is becoming more and more uh, sort of um, normalized and, and seen as a really good way to really with stress and to um, connect with some centering and strength. Um, I'm also noticing that there's a lot more sort of, um, sort of stress and depression and anger uh, that's in society that's loading up our minds. And so there's a real connection between um, sort of the questions that we ask in meditation are not just simply for our own enlightenment, but how do you have social enlightenment how do you have, um, so that's why I'm saying it's uh, who are we as people? And um, you know, if, if we're living in a culture where we fundamentally don't believe that a human being can have wakefulness or enlightenment or these qualities, what are we saying about ourselves um, as a culture? So to me, you know, meditation is really mixed with the culture which it came from, like the time of the Buddha. Um, he was asking very profound questions. Right. And I almost feel like we can ask those same questions, but we're also asking modern questions about where are we right now as people and why we're we meditating and doing yoga. And it's, you know, there, there is some intelligence to that. It's not just wanting answers. And um, in that way, I feel like, especially when you're doing more complicated practices and pujas, you know, it's, it's asking a question. And through meditation, you're, you're not being given the answer, but you're exploring the answer. That's great. Well, I've taken a class with you where you talked about using meditation to train your mind. Don't let the mind, mm. it'll go where it wants to go. Mm. And for a lot of us, that's our problem, mm -hmm. you know? And how, how would you like to comment on that? Is this where I get to rail against social media? <laughs> Is this my moment? <laughs> Oh, you know, I mean, in the end, please understand that yoga is a mind game. It's a game of the mind. This, this is an enterprise about the mind. Um, I, I'll often say, I think I said it in class today, that the Buddha didn't have any different instruments than you and I have. That uh, any enlightened being doesn't have, really, there was nothing unique about them as a creature. They had the exact same instruments. And yet, what, what made a Buddha a Buddha, if I may, Rinpoche, is perception, is this, is moving from one kind of perception to the next. And that's all about the mind. The core of yoga is mind. And, you know, it's easy to get distracted in the gymnastics uh, related to moving your body and stuff like that. I'm not telling my students anything they haven't heard before. Uh, so it's absolutely about mind. And um, the, the challenge that we face, I think, is that uh, culturally and because of technology and stuff, our minds are fundamentally becoming more feeble. When I grew up, uh, before... I, I remember the transition to answering machines, so I just turned 60, so that gives you some idea, but I remember in the early 80s, suddenly there was an answering machine. Suddenly, 
you came home and you found out who called you while you were away. Now before that, you didn't know who called you and you were just fine. <laughs> you didn't know who called you while you were not home. Now, but, but the point I'm making is all of this instantaneous, uh, oh, so what I started to say was that I remembered probably I had at my disposal 40 or 50 phone numbers. How many phone numbers do most of us have access to in our memory now? Two or three, four? In, generally, in general, our, 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 our minds are atrophying because of technology. And this is actually, I think, uh, going to make meditation, and particularly getting to the depths of what uh, I think the three of us have been talking about today, getting to the depths of it requires a stable, clear, calm, tranquil mind that has high level of memory, that has high retentive power for a variety of reasons. So um, that's why today I, I made the case that the, moving your body is important and helpful for a variety of reasons, but moreover, it's the breath. The breath is the real shift in, in the mind. Um, one of the things I say is that when you do posture, you're working effectively, you're interfacing with your past because your body is your material memory. What you eat, what you've thought, what activities you've done are essentially recorded by your body all the time. So when you do asana, you're interacting with your past more than anything else. When you breathe, you're interacting primarily with the present because you can't shape your breath consciously and not be more present. And when you meditate, you're primarily interacting with the future. And if we understand, really, it's about mind. It has to be about mind. Uh, Rinpoche, what does meditation teach you in the Buddhist tradition about mind? Well, one, one thing I just want to... Um, um, <clears throat> comment on what Rod is saying is that, like, one word for uh, meditation in Tibetan is chimpa, and that's been translated as mindfulness. And mindfulness also just basically means memory and to remember. Mm -hmm. It's just remembering the present moment, so remembering the breath. So it's that notion of recollection. And, um, you know, when the early teachings of the Buddha were given, he taught for over 50 years after his enlightenment. And his teachings that we have now, which are, you know, hundreds of volumes of teachings and commentaries, are also his close students saying, this is what I remembered. And so almost everything is, you know, and, and we say, thus have I heard. And, and these are the, you know, just like as we're doing, except there was no recording devices, obviously. So it was a meditation just to listen. It wasn't like, I'll take notes or whatever, I'll check it out later. But you realize this is it. And the fact that the mind could have that kind of precision, it's almost like we can't quite believe it. But it's amazing what the mind is capable of. And I feel like that's part of um, you know, discovering the strength and stability of the mind. So, you know, I, I, you know, I was very curious to hear in terms of you talking about uh, you know, yoga in terms, because it's mostly people do see it as a physical activity. And my understanding from Buddhist point of view, because there's yoga and Buddhism, is that it is really the point of the postures is getting to the sense of, you know, jnana or wisdom, and then getting into that aspect. So. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Deepak, well, tell us about the breath and meditation and how it impacts the mind. And then tell us where the mind is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to again clarify some nuances because we're all speaking in English right now. And um, the word mindfulness is part of our cultural language. But the awareness of the mind is not the mind, right? The awareness of a thought is not a thought. Rinpoche used the word remembrance. Okay. The thought is an object of experience. The mind is an object of experience. Also, it's a shifting object of experience because it's never still. It's a fluctuation, what in Sanskrit is called vritti. It's a fluctuation of your being. Now, mindfulness is a word that's here to stay, but unless you know the nuances of the original Sanskrit or Pali, um, you will, the proper word, which would be a very clumsy word in English, would be awarefulness. 
awareness of the mind, awareness of emotions, awareness of perception, awareness of the body, awareness of that which we call body, mind, and word. So what is the mind? It's a fluctuation. It's a fluctuation of being, it's a fluctuation of consciousness, it's an excitation of consciousness, and it is actually always um, a result of conditioning of the past, sanskaras and vasanas are fluctuations. So you have only two kinds of thoughts, ultimately, about the past and about the future. Um, but you, who's having the thought, is neither in the past nor in the future. You're now, and now is not a moment in time. Now is a state of being in which those fluctuations, fluctuations are arising and subsiding eternally and ceaselessly, creating the concept of time. Yeah. What do you think of time? <laughs> what do you think about it? <laughs> I'd actually like... That was brilliant. That was simple. It's very simple. Very straightforward. Uh, so I, I thought so. That's why I'm a big fan. Um, uh, the, uh, but to, to summarize what Deepak said in a different way, I have bad news. There's no such thing as peace of mind. There's only mind or peace. M peace is the absence of the movement of mind. Yeah. I'd rather answer that than time, the time question. <laughs> That's great. So, um, let's talk about for a second the essence of duality. Deepak, can you give us a little bit of your view on the essence of non-duality? <laughs> non-duality is uh, actually the tradition we are talking about. Uh, all of us ultimately are talking about non-duality, Advaita, which means um, fundamental reality is only one. One without a second, non-dual. And that fundamental reality is immaterial. It's not a physical uh, fundamental reality. And that fundamental reality is all there is. Everything else is an appearance and disappearance in that fundamental reality. It is of the nature of awareness. So, if you were to derive four or five principles from this, some of which I've already stated, but the first principle is everything that you're experiencing right now, everything that you're experiencing right now, or have experienced, is a result of the conditioned mind, projecting itself as experience. And the conditioning is very deep. It's not only your parents and your ancestors, it's your culture, it's your history, it's your religion, it's uh, whatever theology, philosophy you were exposed to, it's even scientific, it's economic. So everything that's happening right now is a result of the conditioned mind. <coughs> Principle number two, that which you call me or I is also a conditioned self, uh, which has no fundamental essence. Uh, it's a differentiated expression of the original mind or the original self. Um, so the conditioned identity is experiencing the conditioned environment. Principle number three, which I already said, now is not a moment of time. Now is the essence of awareness in which there is this ceaseless activity that we call the mind. Principle number four, the real you, which is beyond the mind, was never born and is not subject to death. And the reason for that is that the real you is without form, experiencing itself as all this. Formless being is experiencing itself as this, 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 all this. So that's why uh, it is, first of all, not in time. Secondly, it's imperishable. 
It's indestructible. And all our suffering comes from that which is the attachment to the idea of impermanence, so that which is perishable. So when we truly become non-dual, not just understand non-dual, that is liberation, that is freedom. Yes. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to try an experiment to get at the essence of non-duality, which is going to be this fantastic uh, meditation with these three masters. And But before I start it, I want to see if uh, the Rinpoche or, or Rod would like to comment on Deepak's comments on the essence of non-duality. Rod, do you want to? Oh, my gosh. No, I, I actually stay away from conversations of non-duality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really I do. I have them every day. I mean, Deepak, Deepak has such a you know, brilliant scientist's mind that he, he, can, he can really, uh, it's almost as like we're watching him paint a painting that describes it. But ultimately, it's beyond description. Uh, so there's actually a mantra in, in my lineage that basically only fools wade in to talk about duality or non-duality. And, uh, and then it says, only the Lord knows this answer. Um, so, uh, no, I don't really. Duality? <laughs> Here, here's something. Raise your hand first. <laughs> duality is teenagers. Non-duality is oneness. <laughs> That's my life in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I, I just want to make the point, you know, um, that... That ultimately, and I had the pleasure and the honor uh, to, to spend some time with both these gentlemen last night, and um, uh, you know, I, I shared my thought that in a sense, you know, non-duality, while it is the quintessence and the ultimate arrival of these practices, and there's no doubt that um, with time and dedication, uh, you, you will get to know it if, if you are truly dedicated. But in the meantime, it's not all it's cracked up to be. For most of us, we still have a lot of work to discharge in the world, and in, in non-dual, that non-dual reference, if you will, of perspective, it, it, the, the days of the week are non-existent. You know, the time it is, you know, we all, everyone here was in a timely manner, you, we all kind of observing silence. Silence and non-silence is, is duality. Hunger and not hungry is duality. So, and, and, you know, if you begin to read the accounts of people who actually enter that state, they have to be reminded to eat. They have to be reminded in Ramana Maharishi, who you brought up, Deepak, was he taught where he slept and he slept where he taught and he was told to eat because he wasn't hungry. So it's really not, what I would call it, I would call it the ultimate retirement uh, practice. Um, in the meantime, uh, how do we navigate fear? How do we navigate uh, anxiety? How do we navigate sadness? How do we navigate disappointment? How do we nav navigate our attachments? Duality is not the answer for everything. I mean, excuse me, non-duality is not the answer for everything. Ultimately, of course, it is, because it's all there is. But at the same time, and I think you were speaking to this very uh, wisely, Rinpoche, which was, I loved what you said. It's, it's my big takeaway, the wisdom in our confusion. It's, it's really coming to a greater clarity about how we na navigate the dualistic world skillfully. In non-dualism, there aren't Republicans and Democrats. There, aren't, there isn't money being taken away from certain social issues as we speak. Uh, so I don't want to quite, quite cut the thread to duality quite yet. I want to continue to hone my skill in entering into this other level of experience. But and you want to be aware of it. Uh, you want to be aware that it exists. Both dualistically, oh, and it, yeah, and if, if really only at the end of your life when you're going to retire, you start embarking on non-dualistic practices, it's not going to work. It's going to take many, many diluting the cloth's color or dye, many, many of those experiences to ultimately be able to rest in, in this place that we're talking about as being the culmination. Before you go to yeah. Yeah. very well said, but here's one thing we should clarify. Hmm. Everything that we call civilization and even science is based on duality, subject, object, split, mm. me and you, me and the universe. When we engage in science included, is based on the subject, object, split. And 
Science is great, it can make our life comfortable, gives us technologies. But do remember that science, or let's say the misuse of science, based on a misunderstanding of reality, which is beyond subject-object split, right? The subject-object split is artificial. We have climate change, we have eco-destruction, we have extinction of species, we have poison in our food chain, we have mechanized death, we have atomic bombs and nuclear weapons, which is the karma of duality. And we are risking our extinction because of that. So while to engage in this world, we do need the perception of me and you, me and the other. If we are not aware that the other is me in a different uniform, then we go to these extremes, risking our extinction. Great. I'm gonna, we, don't, we won't have time for questions. Um, beautiful. But I, before Rob's gonna lead off the meditation, we're gonna pass the baton to the Rinpoche and then to uh, Deepak. But I do wanna say that the last time I moderate a panel with the Rinpoche, um, there was a question from the audience, and I want to repeat that question uh, for the audience. Um, and the question was, what will you say on your deathbed? Rinpoche, would you uh, answer that for us? I'll be back. <laughs> Deepak? I was never born. <laughs> Rod? <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs>